transportation in the post-industrial world is radically different from how it used to be. Nowadays it is neatly divided between air, land and sea, dominated by aircraft, roads and railways and motorized cargo ships. But this division was not equally apparent in history, especially the farther back you go. In many European countries, roads were not developed up to snuff until the 17th or even the 20th centuries. You couldn't just uh, take a horse and cart anywhere. People had to be more creative and often flexible. They were much more reliant on water, since it required less energy to travel across, even with uh, rudimentary means. It must also be noted that the sea levels a thousand and especially two thousand years ago were much higher than nowadays. Countries like Norway and Sweden were much more maritime than today, and people are almost entirely dependent on the waterways for travel. But travel by water was not always possible. The river or lake might suddenly be broken up by dangerous rapids or a passage of land. For these purposes, almost every maritime culture has practiced some form of portage, the act of transporting a vessel overland to the next body of water. From the Scottish Highlands to the Caspian Sea, it is most associated with the Vikings, dragging their massive longships from one river to the next, upon large wooden trunks, constantly moved in front of the bow. Large boats could definitely be portaged, but it required considerable effort, and for the most part was uh, simply not worth it. It was only really feasible for short distances, often just to bring the ship into safe storage or a dry dock for the sake of repairs. The larger Viking ships, cargo vessels known as Knarr, were primarily designed for the open sea, passages across the Baltic and North Sea. Portages were not relevant to them. They were relevant for people who wished to travel inland for various reasons. It could be so simple as going to the market, church on Sunday, or visiting your neighbors. But also for warriors looking to raid and pillage, capture forts and cities. Not to mention tradesmen seeking the riches of the Eastern European network. Portaging could definitely be a dangerous undertaking. Someone might slip on the rope and BAM, suddenly everyone has been crushed by a wooden ship. These incidents undoubtedly led to trauma and a bunch of disorders which Vikings probably resolved by drinking mead and going berserk. It's not the healthiest way of dealing with your issues. Guys will literally do anything instead of just getting help. That is, getting better help, the sponsor of today's video. We live in a pretty messed up world, so it's no surprise that mental health issues are on the rise. I myself have been subjected to several unpleasant incidents, and know for a fact how difficult it is to find a therapist, let alone a good therapist. BetterHelp removes this stepping stone and connects you with a credentialed therapist, trained to listen to you and provide helpful, unbiased advice. If you don't think they're a good fit or whatever, you can just get a new one. Neither do you have to leave your home. You can do it all from your phone or computer via call, video chat or messaging. Whichever works best for you. Most of you guys watching have probably not been subjected to combat or portaging trauma, discounting the veterans from the ongoing flame wars in the comments section. Seriously, you guys need help. Jo jokes aside, trying out a therapist is something I highly recommend. Whether you have serious issues like trauma or depression, or simply need to let off some steam. Dude, I mean it, the help. people in your proximity might not want to listen to your problems. You can use my link betterhelp.com slash Baltic Empire to connect with a the therapist to support you from the comfort of your Dude, home. You really the link offers a special discount for your first month. Thanks again to BetterHelp. Get some help, man. Now let's see if we can pull that ship. All of these peoples used very similar boats. They were relatively small, a marked length to breadth ratio to facilitate rowing, and built to be as light as possible. In Sami, Finnic and Slavic boat building traditions, they were dugout canoes carved from a single tree, or light wooding, or even skins sewn together using root fiber. It sounds barbaric, but the lack of ironwork made them exceedingly light and comfortable to transport. They can kind of be compared to modern rubber boats. In the Russian Empire, they'd see continued usage into the 18th century, in northern Sweden, as late as the 1960s. A similar tradition emerged among the inland Norse. An interesting observation can be made at Cape Lindesnes in southern Norway. 
one of the most defined locations of the Viking Age country. In the eastern region, less susceptible to the largest sea, boats were constructed with wooden instead of metal nails. But after the 6th century, most Scandinavian boats, even of a smaller size, were almost exclusively built with iron rivets. The sort of vessels used for Viking Age inland travel could be most distinguished by their light hull. They could be as thin as 4 mm. The thinness can be observed on this runestone from Uppland, a region in which portages were very important. The picture corresponds to a story in the Edda, in which Thor goes fishing. He gets the Midgard serpent on the hook, and during the struggle he manages to tramp his foot through the thin hull. Lightwood, like spruce, was most often used in construction, and vital to achieving the desired thickness was the use of radial splitting, using axes and leaving the fibers intact. The late Middle Ages saw the introduction of sawing, which produced thicker planks even for smaller vessels. The transition from a soft to a stiff hull also required internal ribs for the boats, further increasing their weight. These techniques, in addition to the improvements of roads, led to the decline of portages in 17th century Sweden, at least in the southern regions. They had continued to linger in the northern provinces until the 20th century. Portages were necessary in four scenarios. Firstly, portaging a vessel overland could be faster than traversing the route entirely by sea. Secondly, you might want to enter a body of water, otherwise unreachable. Thirdly, the waterway might be blocked by dangerous rocks or especially rapids. Lastly, portages could be used as a surprise military tactic, moving your fleet to a place where it is not expected. The first three scenarios can be observed on the route from the Varangians to the Greeks, between the Baltic and Black Seas. The conventional sea route between the seas requires you to travel all around Western Europe and through the Mediterranean, much longer than simply traveling up to Dorgava and then portaging the ships over to the Dnieper. Near the end of the Dnieper, the passage is blocked by seven rapids. Here the boats had to be portaged again along the riverbank, until the rapids calmed. The Oxford Dictionary defines portage as follows. 1. The carrying of boats or goods between two navigable waters. 2. A place at which this is necessary. 3. The act or instance of carrying or transporting. b. The cost of this. Portaging included both specific places and the techniques involved in the practice. So, let's pull up our ships, take out the rollers and have a look at the different techniques for transporting the ships overland. Portages were nothing new in the Viking Age. The ancient sea craft of northern Europe have since their inception been light enough to transport over a landmass, even though the practice was poorly if ever documented. Even during the Viking Age itself, it wasn't as if someone provided an extensive written guide on portages, at least none that have survived. Instead we're left with uh, scattered mentions from the sagas, Russian chronicles and Byzantine documents. That is aside from the archaeological evidence. Though evidence of portage techniques from the period in question is rather sparse, it doesn't seem like these techniques changed too drastically from their primordial inception up until the industrial period and abandonment of portages in favor of superior transportation. The timeless quality of portages is fascinating in and of itself. Of course, changes were made, and these will be discussed as well. Anyway, the timeless quality makes it relevant to look at later documentations of portages in the region. Especially prominent are journals of Western travelers in Russia during the early modern age, aside from some other anecdotes from later periods. There have also been several experiments conducted with uh, reproductions, but some of these ships have been flawed as they were constructed with uh, inauthentic techniques, resulting in heavier vessels than the ones most preferable for portaging. Portages were also used outside of Northern Europe. As far back as the 12th century BC, the Egyptians were described as transporting vessels from Coptos to the Red Sea. The mythical queen of Assyria, Semiramis, allegedly mustered Phoenician shipwrights to construct collapsible river craft, transported them on camelback over to the Gulf of Persia to carry out an invasion of India. A similar technique was used by Alexander the Great during his invasion of India, breaking down his fleet and transporting it overland by horse and cart. 
as can be observed in the later Vikings. This allowed for a considerable element of surprise. From the same period, documents describe Greek galleys, triremes and even heavier, as being light enough to be portaged over impressive enough distances. These sorts of vessels were often built in a kit form, meaning that they could be dismantled, transported and reassembled at a new location, pretty much Ikea in the days of Alexander. The most impressive portage of the ancient period was the Diolklos, a three mile maritime railway across the Isthmus of Corinth. Paved with limestone, it allowed for the portage of smaller merchant craft, or the carrying of cargoes from one side to the other. There is some dispute on how the vessels were transported exactly, perhaps on sleds, or even some sort of trolleys fixed to the railway. It seems to have been utilized up until the 9th century, when it was used to transport a large Byzantine fleet in 868. The Northern European peoples, Norse and Balts especially, definitely had a presence in the Bronze Age Mediterranean. Perhaps they witnessed some of the portaging techniques of the region and even brought them home. And though they undertook some quite impressive operations, they would never make anything to rival the Diolklos, which was really one of a kind. Much closer to the Viking Age are the days of Charlemagne. The Franks likewise made use of portages. During an assault on the Saxons in Hardon, Frankish boats were brought ashore and seemingly assembled into a defensive formation around the military camp. Charlemagne himself made efforts to improve portages across his dominion, excavating and improving old canals for the ease of maritime transport. Portages could vary in distance, from a few meters to hundreds of kilometers. The techniques and the overland passage all had to be adapted based on the boats and geography but all portages started the very same way. First up, a decision had to be made whether the boat should be unloaded or keep its cargo. By portaging the ship with all of its stuff still inside, you could transport all of it at once. But this would be heavier and require more effort. It might be more efficient to transport the loose items separately by a more effective land travel method, like horse and cart, or just having people carry it. Parts of the ship could also be removed, ballast, anchors, oars and the steering oar, sails and rigging, and even the mast itself. The mast was probably always felled in order to reduce drag. If the cargo was unloaded, a decision had to be made on whether the goods and personnel should be first conveyed to the other end of the portage or the ship. If the goods are left behind, they might be stolen and would require a guard to keep safe. Splitting the company in two might also be dangerous, depending on the area. The cargo was most often carried by hand. Ships suitable for portages were seldom designed to carry large animals. Wendish vessels in the 12th century were described as being able to hold a horse, and the Norman ships used by William the Conqueror could likewise. Portages could of course be improved by having the locals provide carts and animals, hopefully in return for a small fee. Then it had to be decided on how the ship was to be moved. If the ship was light enough or the passengers numerous enough, the boat could uh, just be carried over the shoulders, empty and turn the boat over to lighten it. Or if you had enough men, keep the cargo inside and carry it all at once. And this was especially feasible over short, flat distances. For longer or uphill portages, it was preferable to pull the vessel. The most simple method was just to drag it over the naked ground. Grass would have been preferable, but it would still have taken its toll on the ship. Repairs might be necessary in the middle of or at the end of the portage, and workshops could often be found at portage settlements. The ship itself could be improved to ease the portage. Most susceptible to damage during the pulling would have been the keel, so in order to protect it was often added a false keel a cover of birch bark trenailed onto the actual keel. It could simply be replaced once damaged, and was known in Norse as drag, meaning pull. Drag appears to have been the Norse word for portages, and it appears across Scandinavia as a place name, indicating to this day where portages were located. Holes were drilled in the stem of the boat, through which ropes were inserted and used for pulling the vessel. This obviously made the process much easier, less dangerous and less demanding for the pullers and the ship itself. Pure ropes could have been used, the longer the better. These could be prone to accidents, the rope bursting, causing the ship to fall back and 
possibly down a slope and into a body of water. This sometimes led historically to ships and cargoes being lost. If the ships had to be pulled over a slope, it would have been preferable to use blocks and tackles, secured around trees. Superior to naked mud or grass would have been snow. By covering the earth with frozen water, a flat, frictionless condition like the sea itself was essentially created. The boats might then have been portaged over the snow upon sleds, or potentially pulled over ice. In these cases, it might have been preferable to leave the boats behind entirely, and conduct the rest of the journey purely by sled. There were of course risks with uh, travelling by ice. It could burst and send the crew and ship to the frigid deeps. The ship would struggle with floating if it was secured to a sled. Harsh winter conditions could also lead to frostbite and other personal damages. The method most associated with portages is the use of rollers. These are wooden logs of any size placed in a pathway before the vessel. When the vessel passes over a roller, it is picked up and placed in the path before it. These serve the purpose of guiding the vessel along the correct path, reducing friction, thus easing the pulling, and preventing damages. Friction was further reduced by coating the rollers in animal fat and keeping them soaked with water. A shallow groove could be cut in the rollers to further improve the trajectory of the keel. And contrary to the name, they didn't actually roll. In Norse they were known as lunur, and were so strongly associated with ships that one expression referred to the ships as lundvigja, roller horses. The size of the rollers depended on the size of the ship. Large vessels might require the harvest of fresh wood from the local forest, whereas smaller ones could even bring rollers with them. In the smallest of vessels, they might be used as seats or braces for the oarsmen, but there exists no archaeological evidence of Viking vessels being found with rollers, indicating that they were mostly harvested on the spot or supplied locally. Alternatives to wood could be used. The Icelanders seem to have used whale bones. Whilst rollers didn't actually roll, portages could be conducted using wheels. According to legend, Oleg of Kiev attacked Constantinople in 907 by fixing wheels onto his ships and then used sail power to sail the ships overland. It sounds ridiculous, but the idea of land yachts is not unfeasible in history. But during the Viking Age it would most likely have damaged the hull structure. Portaging requires extreme control over the vessel to conduct it safely. And if you're sailing on land, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to steer the vessel. Limited use of sails in portaging could have been useful if the conditions permitted, but cautiously and over a limited distance. At the beginning of the 20th century in northern Sweden, on the very border with Finland, boats were portaged by using wheeled carriages with boat-shaped ribs in which the actual boats could be perfectly inserted. But who was actually supposed to pull the ship? most apparent would be the oarsmen. These would often be indistinguishable from warriors and traders. The crewmen of a viking ship would usually hold shares in the ship and cargo. These were probably the strongest and most able pullers, but in a dangerous area it might be preferable to keep them on guard instead and protect the caravan from bandits. Slaves made up an important export of the voyages through Eastern Europe and they could be taken off the ships and forced to pull them over the portage. But it would most likely only have been a complementary and not a complete supplement. These vessels were small and could only transport a limited number of passengers, slaves included. It was not like the slave ships of the later Triangle trade. The slaves sold to Byzantium and the Caliphate were primarily household servants for the wealthy and exported in a relatively small amount. A lot of them would have been women and children, unsuitable for pulling the boats, so slaves could not have been relied upon for the portage. Next on the list of potential workforce were the local inhabitants. If the travelers were armed, they could of course use their weapons to force the locals to pull for them. This would not be optimal for a sustainable relationship, as would be necessary for a trade route. It might work better for one-time operations, especially raids or military campaigns. Even then, these attacks might be preludes to permanent occupation or even a trade route, so using the pen rather than the sword might be preferable. Indeed, it was better just to pay the locals. On regular routes, they would probably be quite accessible and ready to assist anyone needing it, from the goodness of their hearts or the desires of their purses. 
Additionally, if they were serfs or slaves under a local lord, he might force them to portage for him, in return for payment or a favour, or even if the travellers were part of his own retinue. A relevant anecdote can be found in the Primary Chronicle, in which Queen Olga of Kiev obliged her people to carry the Derevelian Slavs to her in their boats. When she proposed this, the people lamented that slavery is to be their lot. Of course, this was all part of Olga's scheme to avenge a blood debt. As for the pulling methods themselves, the ropes could simply be pulled by hand, over the shoulder, whatever, but a popular method, at least in the later years, was to secure the ropes around the chests of the pullers. This can even be observed on this 19th century painting of the Volga boatmen. Some men would assist the pullers from the back of the ship by pushing against the stern using long poles. Humans aren't always keen on exhausting themselves, so it would have been preferable to use draft animals for the portage, oxen or horses. As mentioned previously, the boats best suited for portages would usually not carry animals of this size. In general, the trade goods they ferried were usually luxury items, light and in small amounts, stuff like silver coins, furs, jewellery and cloth. Anyway, draft animals were best provided by the local inhabitants, specifically for this purpose. I've mentioned local inhabitants on several occasions, and it's about time we get into the discussion on how the portages were improved. The techniques aforementioned could be used anywhere, most often on fresh terrain previously unexplored. But for well-frequented portages, they would be improved for the practice pretty much instantly. This can be observed in the saga of Ingvar Vifforli. Ingvar led an expedition to the east, meant to explore the possibility of opening up a new trade route to the Caliphate. His idea was to make a portage between the Black Sea and Caspian over the Kingdom of Georgia, not the American state, the country in the Caucasus. After pulling his ships over the harsh terrain, Ingvar ordered it improved by felling trees, making spades and digging a channel. The process took several months. This indicates that the Norsemen expected to have somewhat maintained facilities at their overland trade routes. The most apparent and basic improvement of a portage was what Ingvar did, digging a ditch. This would not only provide easier pulling for the ship, but also give the apparent advantage of marking the fastest and safest route for pulling. The ditch could further be improved by structural additions. Most basic was laying down rollers in it flat. In 1939, portaging over a slight groove was described as follows. The husband and his wife took hold of their boat by the oarlocks and pulled it into the groove. Then the husband took the stem and his wife the stern, and they pushed the boat over the rollers until it rolled freely and speedily over them. The small furrows furnished with little rollers in Lapland were known as Morkur. Larger ditches could be furnished with more interesting constructions. At the aptly named Draget near Birka, Draget literally meaning the pulling, the portaging ditch was furnished with closely spaced logs laid along the slopes of the ditch in a herringbone pattern. If properly greased and moisturized, this would have been one of the most optimal portaging constructions. It was probably not fun to walk over it, so the pulling was most likely done from the sides of the ditch. Another very interesting construction used in Russia was a type of bridge. In 1610 it was described and illustrated by a Dutch visitor as constructed for transportation over the morasses of Estonia. By the time of his visit, they were so rotten as to be dangerous for travelling. It doesn't seem as they were used for transporting ships in 1610, rather humans, wagons and animals. The most complex of portage constructions were man-made canals, filled with water and used for transporting the vessel from one body of water to the next. The boats could either be pulled along the sides of the canal or moved by using poles stuck into the bottom of the canal, like a raft. Construction of canals was costly in resources, and seldom done over especially large distances. Portaging would wear down the boats and the pullers, creating a demand for rest and repairs. Settlements would often appear in conjunction with portages. A prime example is the settlement of Gnostava, near modern-day Smolensk in Russia. It is located at the end of a portage between the Dogova River and the Dnieper. It doesn't seem as though the settlement was built before the beginning of the 10th century when the Dnieper trade route truly began to flourish. Gnostava was located quite a stretch away from the most effective portage, 
meaning that the travelers had to sail up river to access it. But it was most likely worth it. Gnostava was a prominent trading post, and also had a man-made canal between the river leading to an inner lake, which was used as a harbor and shipyard. Findings of locally made iron rivets indicates that it was used for Scandinavian style shipbuilding, and possibly as a center for dugout production. Settlements like Gnostava could also supply draft animals for the pulling, and horses appear to have had cultural significance within this settlement in particular. Gnostava was one of the richest settlements in the region, all thanks owing to the portage. When the trade route died down in the 11th century, Gnostava was quickly abandoned in favor of nearby Smolensk, which was more agriculturally self-sufficient. If you wish to learn more about this fascinating settlement, I already have a video about Gnostava published. In Eastern Europe, the portages were known as Voloch, and just like the Drag in Scandinavia, it appears as a place name such as Volochysk in Ukraine or Volochanka in Russia, both indicating their possible historical purpose. But it wasn't until the 13th century and after the Viking Age that efforts were made to improve the portages and traveling routes. An important part were the so-called Yami, a resting post. Better roads allowed for the use of wagons and horses to transport the trade goods from one portage to the next. During winter, when the lands lay covered in snow, they could be traversed by a sled instead. And here appears the critique of portages, or rather the debate of whether one ship was used for the entire route or whether ships were exchanged along it. Travel accounts from the early modern period often describe this. In the Russian context, heavier cargo ships might only sail into an accessible port, Novgorod for example, where the cargo was unloaded and stowed into smaller boats for sailing further south, upon wagons, or upon sleds. At every portage, instead of portaging the old ship, they might change it for a new one. The old ship might be put in storage until the travelers returned. Some of these boats might be constructed seasonally and only for a single voyage, as was recounted in the Byzantine De Administrando Imperio. The Rus were described as collecting these dugouts from their Slavic tributaries as a sort of tax and continuously modifying them along the way finally adding sails and rigging as they reached the Black Sea. These longer portaging and river routes could be infinitely complex, and no voyage was likely the same. As can be attested to by later journals, travelers were very much dependent not only on the technical factors, but also on water levels, climate and weather. A late or early winter could open up new opportunities or close them. Frozen rivers prevented the use of boats, but allowed the use of sleds. Rain and muddy seasons were bad for any travel by ground, but could even be a boon for travel by water, if it caused excessive flooding. That is all besides the social factors. Traveler accounts in later years recount the decline of bridges, or how the Russian Tsars would deliberately neglect the roads close to the capital as a measure against insurrection. Contested territory and banditry made travel unsafe and inaccessible to some. In all cases, travelers had to be flexible and creative. To finish off the video, let's take a look at some important Viking Age portages across the Viking world. In Norway, Denmark, Sweden and Ukraine. At the southern tip of Norway lies a nowadays seemingly insignificant peninsula known as Lindesnes. In actuality, it is quite small, but on early maps it appears seriously inflated. Not so much a mistake as a sign of respect, fear or warning to any traveler. Sailing, especially during the Viking Age, was almost entirely done by hugging the coast, and Lindesnes was one of the more dangerous places to round. Even in later periods with improved sail ships, stopping at Lindesnes and waiting to cross, sometimes for months, was often the norm. Archaeological efforts have revealed the presence of a significant settlement at Lindesnes, including boat graves, huge boathouses and an early stone church. Most important to the purposes of this video is the finding of a canal going between the North Sea and Linefjord. Seemingly known as Groben, the canal appears to have been constructed during the migration period, during which the sea levels were much higher, and the canal went straight through from one body of water to the next. The original structure was 12 meters wide and 1.5 meters deep. During the Viking Age, the sea levels had sunken, 
and the canal only went roughly halfway of its original distance. But it appears still to have been used, and the location was incredibly important for controlling traffic in Kattegat. It is not known when Groben was last in use. In 1591, a very old local, allegedly aged 110, remarked how the canal had been dug a very long time ago, so that ships could go through there. Using the portage would have been safer than crossing Lindesnes, and faster than waiting for favorable weather conditions. Moving further south in Katyat, we arrive at a similar construction on the island of Samsø in Denmark. In 1726 AD was here constructed a canal between Stansfjord to the east and Moropvik in the west. It is 500 meters long and 11 meters wide. The walls of the canal were reinforced at least at certain points by wooden planks. It is believed that the portage was used as a dragging site well before the digging of the canal, and this was definitely a natural progression of well-used portages. Known as the Kanhewe Canal, its purpose has not exactly been defined. The canal seems to have been fitted for lighter warships, and the fjord which it runs up to was well suited as a harbour. Archaeological evidence points to the fjord having been used for ship repairs. Thus, it is believed that Samso was used as a military harbour by a local warlord. Birka is an island located smack dab on Lake Mälaren in middle Sweden, on an ancient water route called Fyrisleden, and served as a nexus point for portages. Södertälje to the south, 100 meters long, and the appropriately named Draget to the north. Draget means the pulling. It was a canal at least 500 but possibly up to a thousand meters long, and lined with timber in a triangular sort of construction. It was discovered during the construction of a highway, which is quite befitting. The portage was broken up by two small lakes before finally culminating in Lake Stora Ulvifjarden. From Ulvifjarden one could access the settlement of Uppsala, an important religious site in the Viking Age. The northern tip of the portage was protected by a stone hill fort and was most likely controlled by the local monarchy, who throughout the Viking Age had its seat at Birka or Uppsala. Moving down from Scandinavia to the end of the eastern route, in what is now southern Ukraine and the lower end of the Dniepro, here lie seven dangerous rapids, which had to be circumvented by portage. They were well documented in the Byzantine text, the Administrando Imperio, from which I will draw references. The first rapid was called Esupi, meaning do not sleep. It was narrow and pierced by high rocks, standing in the river like islands. They were too dangerous to pass between, so the boats were carried ashore. The cargo was left in the boats, which were dragged from the bow and stern. There are no mentions of portage improvements. The pullers simply felt the naked ground with their feet for rocks, which might damage the vessel. After passing the first rapid and sailing further down the Dniepro, they encountered a second rapid, called Ulvoshi in Norse and Ostrovunipras in Slavic, meaning the island of the barrage. Also note that I'm using the Greek transcriptions of Norse and Slavic words, so they are not entirely correct. The scholars have retranscribed and detected the meanings of these words, but it's not especially relevant to discuss here. Ulvoshi was passed in a similar manner to the first. Then they encountered Gelandri, meaning noise of the barrage. The fourth was called Niasit in Slavic, named after the pelican nests in the stones of the rapid. In Norse it was called Aifur, and it was commended on a Gotlandic runestone. It was one of the more dangerous rapids to cross, as it required a portage of six miles. This made the travelers susceptible to attack by the nomadic Pechenegs, mounted archers who would make easy prey of the travelers as they dragged or carried the ships on their shoulders. The last rapids were called Varufosh, Vulniprash, Lianti Verutsi, meaning boiling of the water, and finally the Little Barrage, Strukun, Naprezi. The dangers of Pechneg assault can be attested to by the life of Prince Sviatoslav. When boldly deciding to cross the rapids, he was attacked by the Pechnegs and killed. They fashioned a drinking cup out of his skull. Measures were eventually undertaken by the Rus to defend the rapids deploying Drushina cavalry to patrol it, and eventually occupying the area itself. The only instance in which I have not discussed portages proper is their use as a military tactic. In the Sverri saga, Sverri has recently been crowned king of Norway, but faces opposition to his rule from several barons and Orm King's brother. 
Porter just are mentioned at several points in the story and without particular description, seemingly not viewed as out of the ordinary. Orm gains the upper hand when he drags his 14 large ships from a lake called Tyrfi to nearby Ransfjorden to launch an attack on King Sverri. When Sverri catches wind of this, he gathers 40 of his men and cuts down enough trees to make rollers. Then he drags his recently captured fleet on a 5 mile non stop portage to Miosh, where his enemy had their base. The saga stresses that such a portage had never been done at this location, and that the surprise of it allowed Sverri to launch a sudden attack on his enemies and claim victory in the civil war. The possibilities of portages were almost endless as shortcuts on a long journey, a safety measure, a surprise military tactic, or simply to reach better fishing waters. Beyond the Viking Age, before and after, it would see continued usage. From ancient Greece and Egypt, to the American frontier and the outback provinces of 20th century Sweden. It was an element absolutely vital to the pre-industrial maritime world, and deserves all the recognition it is due. Thank you for watching, please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter if you wish to help the channel along.